Hi, and welcome back. We're going to talk about dither today, and hopefully by the end of this video you'll know enough to never have to worry about it again. I like to test my DAW dither from time to time, as it's not unknown for bugs to creep into dither algorithms. And when they do, it can take a surprisingly long time before anyone notices. I usually start with a snare drum sample. Doesn't really matter which, I've picked this one more or less at random. And I have a free bitmeter plugin running, which confirms that this sample has 24 bits of resolution. We can see quite clearly that only the top 24 bits are active. As a little aside, let's pop up the routing window, and I'll make a tiny little change to the gain. I'm just going to drop the level by one tenth of a dB. Notice what that does to our resolution. Now we're using all 64 of the available bits, because processing with 64 bit resolution will produce results with 64 bit resolution. So let's reset the channel to Unity. And the next step is to add a nice long lush reverb. Notice how that reverb tail decays on the bit meter long after we can't hear it anymore. And now it's gone. Now this reverb tail is going to get rendered multiple times and we want it to be exactly the same every time. We can achieve that by either removing any modulation from the reverb tail, like so, or if in doubt, just go ahead and render it as an audio file. Now we don't need the original, so let's get rid of that. And now we've just got a nice, long, smooth reverb tail sample. OK, let's pop up the routing page again. And this time I'm going to drop the gain right down to minus 60 dB. Yes, that's right, minus 60, 6 zero, which is virtually a mute, really. This is quiet enough that we don't see it on the meter at all, although we can still see it in the bit meter. And I'm going to render that a few times over. Let's start off at 24 bits with no dither applied. I'll call that 24 bit no dither. And let's go ahead and render. OK, let's do the same again, but this time I'm going to pick 16 bit. Let's rename that 16 bit no dither. And again, I'm going to leave those dither options unticked. One more file, 16 bit again, this time with the dither ticked. And let's call it 16 bit dither. And last one for now, I'll also tick noise shaping, which I'll abbreviate to NS. And now let's pull those into a fresh project and see what they sound like. OK, here they are, and they all look completely blank. If I zoom the waveform to its maximum possible height, you can just about see that there is some content there. But I've set the faders for all these tracks at plus 60 dB to compensate for the 60 dB attenuation we applied before rendering. So let's have a listen to the 24-bit version. And that sounds fine to me. Really, no different to the original, to my ears. OK, let's listen to the 16-bit no dither file. Oh dear. That's not a subtle difference. Not only do we have horrendous distortion in this region here, where we're down to just one or two bits flipping on and off, but then from about here onwards, there's literally nothing at all. It's dropped below the level of the lowest bit. And we've just got silence. OK, let's listen to the 16-bit file with dither.
So this time we've got a constant noise running through the whole signal, which is actually quite obnoxious sounding. But the reverb tail continues behind it long after the point where it just stopped dead in the no dither version. I can still clearly hear that reverb well past that marker I dropped. So the noise isn't just masking the distortion. In fact, we're actually gaining extra dynamic range that would otherwise have been lost. OK, let's have a listen with noise shaping as well. This is just as effective at extending the reverb tail and preserving that extra information that would have been lost. But this time, the noise itself is much less obnoxious sounding. OK, that all seems to be in order. But what about third-party posh dither, if you like? Let's go back to our original test. And this time, I'll load up a copy of Ozone 9 in the master section. This offers a special name brand dither called Megabitmax. I'm not running any other modules, just the dither at 16 bits on the default medium setting. But I switched the noise shaping to its maximum setting. And let's render that out. This time I'll call it 16-bit isotope dither. But I'm going to make sure I turn off the native dither. I don't want to dither twice, as this would just add a double helping of noise with no added benefit at all. Let's have a listen to that one. The noise sounds very different to Reaper's noise-shaped dither, with more low-end and less high-end. This is perhaps warmer and softer sounding, and maybe less obnoxious. But honestly, there's not a great deal in it. There are famous mastering engineers out there who will tell you that the choice of dither is absolutely critical. But you have to remember that this is boosted by 60 dB. Unless you're mastering very dynamic classical music, the difference between those two is likely to be totally negligible. Now, what if you have a dither plugin on your master channel, but your DAW doesn't offer post-fade slots, so that the master fader comes after the dither? It's quite important that you don't change the level of the dither noise, because this is calculated quite carefully. Which means in a DAW like Reaper, if you've got dither on the master channel, then you've got to leave the master fader at unity. But what actually happens if you do it wrong? Let's drop the gain of the master channel by 6 dB. And in order to keep the gain of the sample the same, I'll compensate by adding 6 dB of gain in the plugin, which will be before the dither. And let's render that and call it dither gain change. OK, here's the isotope dithered file with incorrect gain changes applied. So we definitely haven't completely broken it. Let's compare to the correctly applied isotope dither. Interestingly, it's the noise that's changed, really. The reverb tail still decays smoothly, so we haven't completely broken the dither. But we seem to have broken the noise shaping, as the noise now sounds a lot harsher and brighter. Nevertheless, this is still way better than the undithered version. And so the first rule of dither is, always use dither when creating a 16-bit file. OK, let's talk about the 24-bit version. This sounds fine to me, even 60 dB down. But a 24-bit WAV file is still an integer format, 
just with eight more bits than a 16-bit WAV file. As each bit represents almost exactly 6 dB of dynamic range, that means, theoretically, that nasty crunchy distortion we heard in the 16-bit file should also be happening in the 24-bit file, only 48 dB lower in level. Let's find out if that's true. Here's the same test, but this time I'll drop the level another 48 dB, so we have 108 dB of attenuation, which in practice really is just a mute. This is probably more attenuation than the mute button on most analog consoles. Nevertheless, it still shows up on Bitter. And let's try rendering. I'll start with a 32-bit floating point file. This will be our control this time. Notice that when I select 32-bit float, the dither options are greyed out. OK, next we'll have 24-bit, but I'll leave the dither off. 24-bit, no dither, OK. 24-bit, this time with dither. And finally, 24-bit with dither and noise shaping. And let's see how those come out. Here's the results. Let's try the 32-bit file with no dither. Obviously, I've boosted this up by 108 dB this time. OK, let's try the 24-bit file with no dither. And this is just as crunchy and distorted as the 16-bit file at minus 60 dB. 24-bit file with dither. And probably no surprises, the dither plus noise shaping version sounds best once again. So the second rule of dither is always use dither when creating a 24-bit file. But it's also safe to conclude that if you have to boost the signal by over 100 dB to hear the problem, it's not really a problem. If you forget to dither your 24-bit render, I promise no one will ever notice. But wait a minute, there's a conflict. I've also heard the rule, only dither once. Does that apply? And if so, what if I render a 24-bit mix that's then mastered to 16-bit? That means I have to dither the 24-bit file, then dither it again when it goes to 16 bits. Is that wrong? Well, no. That rule is often misunderstood. Really, it should be only dither to 16-bit once. 24-bit dither noise is so low in level that it really doesn't matter how many times it's applied. It's never going to be audible. If you stick to 24 bits or more for all your production, and then only add 16-bit dither once right at the end when converting the master to 16-bit, you're golden. The 24-bit dither noise will be so far below the least significant bit of the 16-bit file that it's as if it never happened. OK, let's complicate things slightly. What if you need to convert the sample rate as well? Fourth rule, always dither last. That means you convert the sample rate first, then dither to 16 bits second. But wait a minute, let's walk through the process. Here's a 48 kHz master, which I rendered at 24 bits, and I correctly used 24-bit dither. Let's pull up the bit meter and verify that, yes indeed, we've got 24 bits of data. Now I'll convert the sample rate to 44.1 using the isotope 64-bit SRC algorithm that's included in this old version of SoundForge, but slightly annoyingly not in my newer version. If we check the bottom right, we can see the file is now 44.1 kHz, but still 24-bit. But is it really? Well, in fact, there's a clue in the name 64-bit SRC. Just like the simple volume change at the start of the video, processing with floating point resolution gives results with floating point resolution. SoundForge is clever enough to preserve that extra resolution behind the scenes 
so your audio data doesn't actually drop to 24 bits between each process. But what's going to happen when I hit Control S to save? In fact, this file will then be truncated to 24 bits and we'll get 24-bit quantization distortion again. There are three ways you can approach this issue. You could just ignore it. Seriously, no one is ever going to notice. Or you could explicitly add 24-bit dither to the file before you hit save and actually truncate the data to 24-bit. Or, if you know you're rendering a file that will need sample rate converting, you could just render a 32-bit file instead. Then you don't need any dither until you drop to 16 bits right at the end. OK, here's another interesting little test. We're back to 60 dB of attenuation, so the 16-bit dither test. But this time I'm going to render it as, um, sorry, not that one, as an MP3 file. Let's go for maximum bitrate and quality to give it the best possible shot. But notice that the dither options are greyed out, just like when I rendered a 32-bit WAV file, which is interesting. Okay, here's the rendered MP3. Let's give that 60 dB of gain. And that sounds fine to me. The dither options are greyed out because we apparently didn't need them. That sounds to me just like the 24-bit control. So let's go further and try the 108 dB test. Let's call this 108 dB test. Again, MP3, maximum bitrate and quality. And I'll render again. OK, let's pull that one in and give it 108 dB of gain. And let's have a listen. And again, even 108 dB down, that MP3 file still sounds just as good as the 32-bit file. So does that mean that an MP3 file is actually better quality than a 24-bit WAV? Which does this at the same gain level. Is that a safe conclusion to draw? Well, perhaps not. Let's try importing this file into a different application. Here's SoundForge. And again, our test MP3 appears totally silent when I drag it in. We'll need to boost the gain, of course. SoundForge doesn't allow me to apply 108 dB of gain in one go, which is probably sensible, to be honest. But I can do it in stages. There's 20 dB. And 40 dB. And 60. 80, 100 dB of boost. I don't need to apply the final 8 dB to see that there's simply nothing there. It really is total silence. We get a clue as to why if we look at the bottom right-hand corner. SoundForge has decoded this MP3 as a 16-bit PCM file. And of course, our 108 dB of attenuation has dropped the levels way below the least significant bit of a 16-bit file. So let's try the first MP3 with only 60 dB of attenuation. And let's boost that up by 60 dB. We can already see that this file isn't silent. And let's have a listen. Now, we know that this distortion isn't burnt into the MP3 because it's not there when we import it into Reaper. But clearly, SoundForge is creating 16-bit PCM files when it decodes the MP3. And that's where the quantization distortion happens. To verify this, I used Reaper's batch converter to create MP3s from all the 16-bit examples I created earlier. And I've imported them and boosted them all up by 60 dB. Sure enough, the simple dither works just as it did when it was a WAV file. The reverb tail decays for much longer, but we've got extra obnoxious noise as well. 
with noise shaping, the noise sounds a bit less objectionable. But actually not by much, as if the MP3 encoding has partially broken the noise shaping. Here's the isotope dither. And again, the noise sounds much nastier than before encoding. Here's the WAV version for reference. So, a couple of conclusions from this. You could argue that Reaper is correct to grey out the dither options for MP3 renders, as it's true that the encoder is floating point, so rendering an MP3 file doesn't actually mean you're going to a fixed point format. The problem is, we don't know what's going to happen when it's decoded. If it's decoded to 16-bit PCM, and there's no dither noise burnt into the file, you'll get truncation and distortion. I've seen well-known mastering engineers campaigning to get more aggregators to accept 24-bit files for distribution, on the basis that lossy encoders are floating point and more than capable of encoding the extra dynamic range. But perhaps they miss the point, as who knows what the decoder on the user's device will be doing. It's probably a safer bet to encode MP3s from a 16-bit dithered file. That means manually adding 16-bit dither when rendering MP3s from Reaper. Or you could render a 16-bit WAV file with dither, then convert that to MP3 as a separate step using the batch processor. OK, so now you know how to use dither properly and how to test your DAW's dither to make sure it's working OK. Now, stop worrying about it and focus on all the other aspects of music production, because literally every one of those will matter more at the end of the day. Thanks for watching. Thank you.